This video was made possible by my Diamond Level Patron, Daniel Shillito. You can commission your own review right now by going over to my Patreon and becoming a Diamond Patron. Something a lot of horror movies forget to focus on is the human element. Our thoughts and emotions are a well of narrative potential that can replace or enhance any monster imaginable. In the 1930s, author John W. Campbell Jr. set out to weaponize human paranoia and mistrust in his planned novel Frozen Hell, which would eventually be shortened into the novella Who Goes There. However, most people know the narrative for what it was adapted as in 1982, John Carpenter's The Thing, where a group of Antarctic scientists become plagued by a shape-changing alien able to imitate any living being. Despite being a commercial failure when it first released, The Thing has become a lasting influence and a cult classic, widely regarded as one of the greatest horror movies ever made. The reason this film is so acclaimed is because of how flawlessly it translates the paranoia and claustrophobia of who goes there, developing and refining the themes of the narrative, becoming the perfect adaptation, becoming even better than the source material. So buckle up, because today I'll prove why The Thing is a masterpiece of of mistrust. Why don't we just wait here for a little while? See what happens. The setting of the thing immediately establishes the importance of trust within the narrative. Carpenter deliberately traps his unfortunate protagonist within possibly the loneliest, most isolated area in the world. Antarctica. The landscape is hostile and haunting, a complete barren desert with nowhere to hide. You'd think the perfect horror setting would be claustrophobic and contained, trapping characters into tight corridors, but the thing works so well because of its openness. It's almost too quiet and peaceful because there's nothing around. There's no shelter and the protagonist can't be rescued until spring, so there's no escape. It manages to feel claustrophobic by completely opening up the story to such a wide and expansive landscape, completely shut off from the rest of the world. The cold and bitter polar winds howl through the movie to help emphasize how helpless the crew are. Their communication cuts off, creating such an authentic atmosphere of distinct horror unlike any other horror movie. They have nowhere to turn. If they stay, they die. If they run, they die. They're in a lose-lose position and it quickly transforms the once calm and warm science centre into a prison cell. The characters trapped inside as the alien menace easily and quickly possesses and duplicates to its heart's content. The interiors on a soundstage refrigerated to around 4 degrees Celsius, chilling the rooms and the characters as a constant reminder of the biting cold because they're not just having to fight the thing, they're having to fight the very environment environment too. This is explored heavily, escape routes being torn away and generators being broken beyond repair, further isolating the characters bit by bit over the course of the story. All they can do is work together and trust each other, which is hard enough in an environment like this, but it gets even harder when you have an alien creature killing you one by one by impersonating your own colleagues and making it impossible to trust anyone. So how do we know who's human? Trust is important in such an isolated and desolate place, because you're trapped with the people around you. That's why the perfect villain for such a setting is paranoia and cabin fever. The titular thing is a shape-shifting alien creature frozen in time and recently uncovered by a Norwegian outpost. From the moment the dog is bounding along the snowy landscape evading a helicopter, there's an immediate unsettling atmosphere. You know there's just something off about the whole scene and the dog itself, which is quick and effective build-up. When you look back with hindsight, you can see that this is the single moment the entire cast is doomed. Their big mistake is trusting the dog rather than the Norwegians chasing it. There's a language barrier, so there's immediate mistrust that leads to the Americans killing the Norwegians because they think they're under threat. It immediately sets this paranoid tone. On one hand is a fluffy and cute dog, and on the other is a seemingly crazed scientist brandishing a gun and throwing grenades around. We're more prone to trust in dogs than humans because of them being man's best friend, so the fact that the humans trust the dog is their biggest mistake and sets the tone for the entire movie because how could they have known it was actually an alien threatening the entire planet? There are two reasons the monstrous thing is so effective. First of all, it has absolutely incredible practical effects. All these old-fashioned techniques create in such chilling visuals as a grotesque creature forces its way out of animals and people. This mechanical animation only ever aging better because of how unnatural it looks. It looks dated in the best way, because it makes you uncomfortable with how it moves. The mutations perfectly use gore without it being too try-hard or edgy. They look horrifying and bizarre in such a creepy way. 
However, masterfully, these kinds of visuals are only ever shown as a payoff, where the creature is forced out of its hiding places. So it makes these reveals climactic, because the film tends to leave things to the imagination and focus on the human aspect of it all. Yes, the best part about the alien threat is its ability to imitate its prey and deceive everyone around it. Somebody in this camp ain't what he appears to be. Right now, that may be one or two of us. By spring, it could be all of us. It can be anyone or anything at any given time, creating the ultimate feeling of mistrust. The characters cannot afford to let their guard down to trust anyone else because who knows whether they're actually who they say they are. The idea of comfort becomes an unattainable luxury because at any moment there could be a threat lurking anywhere, hiding in plain sight which leads to a constant suspenseful atmosphere of terror and paranoia. You can only trust yourself because only you know whether you're human or alien. Nobody trusts anybody now. We're all very tired. One character that perfectly personifies this necessary selfishness is Kurt Russell's RJ McCready. He's no brave action hero, protecting everyone and fighting the alien off to save those around him. He's instead a very realistic character, not overly emotional and he never exactly minces his words. It's not like he's some misunderstood character who actually has a heart of gold. He simply looks out for himself, which is why he's able to survive the entire movie. He's just a normal guy up against massive odds, and he does whatever is necessary. We're not meant to trust him or see him as a pure protagonist. We simply see that he is the most competent and pragmatic member of the team. That's what makes him such a good anchor for the story, because he single-handedly represents that urge to survive. His main priority is looking out for number one, and that's what anyone else would do in this deadly situation. From the beginning, he accepts he can't trust anyone. So if the others are able to survive with him, then great. But he's not doing what he does for them, he's doing it for himself. And since he's this lone wolf type character, we need another to to conflict this and clash with him. This comes in the form of Childs, the pair constantly having disputes and refusing to trust each other. Then I'll have to kill you, Child. Then kill me. Together, they're the personification of the central themes of mistrust, since they're antagonistic towards each other because of the situation and how they respond to it. You're gonna have to sleep sometime, McCready. I'm a real light sleeper, Child. One of the standout scenes that both shows the deception of the thing and their character dynamics is the blood scene, where McCready ties all the characters to a sofa in order to test their blood and find out which one is the thing. Because all the blood is actually an independent creature that would try and survive. It's a tense scene, no music playing because it's unnecessary. All it is is character tension, because any of them could be the thing. It's such a methodical and slow scene showing how the audience themselves have been drawn into this world of paranoia and uncertainty. There have been enough clues to suggest any one of these men could be the monster, but there also hasn't been enough concrete evidence to prove anything at all. It's a scene full of surprises, proving that some of the more antagonistic characters were actually safe after all, a concept the film explores because some completely clean humans have been killed, like Clark, who was suspicious because he was close to the dog that started it all, but this scene proves and Clark was human, huh? which makes you a murderer, don't it? For a brief period of the movie, we can't even fully trust McCready himself, since there's a scene where his jacket is found torn through, something the monster apparently does when it takes someone's form, indicating that even our main character might not be who he says he is. Even we as the audience can't allow ourselves to trust the central protagonist. This character dynamic all culminates at the end of the movie as Charles returns from being absent, only he and McCready surviving the events of the movie. However, due to that absence, we don't actually know if we can trust Charles, because he could be the thing. And similarly, Charles doesn't know if he can trust McCready either, which is the ideal way to end the story, this ambiguous air of mistrust lingering long after the film is over. We never find out if Charles is human or not, and that's the perfect final note. There have been multiple fan theories, like McCready being the thing because we didn't see him draw blood, or Charles being the thing because we don't see his breath and he happily takes a swig from the bottle which might actually be petrol, but we don't know for sure, which works so well because of these two characters being paranoid and untrusting of each other throughout. We've had that constant tension bubbling underneath and now it comes down to just them in the cold, too tired and weak to do anything else, resigned to their fates. And it's very likely that neither is the thing, but they'll never know because they can't let go of that paranoia and distrust even when they're freezing to death. It's such a bleak yet perfect ending to the movie that sums up all the themes brilliantly. But McCready and Childs are simply the main two figures representing the paranoia the thing brings to the story. 
There's also a wider cast who don't exactly have a lot of development, but they still feel like real human beings in a deadly life or death situation. The methodical pacing and feeling of isolation slowly and steadily increases the tension bubbling underneath, creating a feeling of this cabin fever that eventually explodes with dramatic effect, as the characters lose all trust within each other. The thing doesn't even need to be around to create chaos and paranoia, because it's hard enough to maintain your sanity in this extreme and lonely setting. Characters kill each other without being the monster because the tension and character dynamics boil over, all simply fueled by the effects of the monster infiltrating them and being this ever-present threat and danger. The genius of the movie is the subversion of the typical man versus monster narrative, instead turning it into personal human horror. It tells a tale about how fear and paranoia can impact personal relationships and our ability to work together, making us fight each other instead of the real threats. It's reflective of our own world and society, how we turn on each other rather than working together to overcome adversaries like pandemics, natural disasters and war. The Thing isn't just a story about an alien monster trying to take over the world and kill everyone, it's a tale about how quickly and easily communication and trust gives way to secrets and paranoia. Trust's a tough thing to come by these days. Even beyond the characters, the film maintains this fear and paranoid atmosphere through the camera work and music. Ennio Morricone's pulsating score of synths is incredibly brooding and puts you on edge. It's simple but spine tingling and effective, which makes it all the more tragic that it received a Razzie Award for the worst film score. There's a recurring leitmotif that regularly plays and it constantly reminds you of the desolation of the setting and the eeriness of the events on screen. It's not one of those film scores that jumps out in your face and tells you to be scared. It sneaks into the scenes and lingers there, always waiting in the wings, just like the thing itself. You never know when that haunting music will start up again, so whenever it does, it immediately affects you in such a delightfully devilish way. It's even more impressive when you find out that Morricone couldn't even watch the film because it wasn't finished yet, so he essentially had to improvise when making the score. Even the inclusion of Superstition by Stevie Wonder is an inspired choice. Without you realising, it establishes that tone of mistrust and paranoia. On the surface, it's an upbeat and funky song, but when it's combined with a wandering camera and the dark empty corridors, it takes on a very sinister and foreboding meaning. Some of the lyrics of the song, like The Devil's On His Way, create some good foreshadowing, so it adds another unexpectedly brilliant layer to the whole movie and its themes. Similarly, the film keeps the lighting specific to the locations, making the outside cold and unwelcome, whilst the inside is more warm and inviting, creating a sense of safety that becomes less and less secure as the coldness and blueness creeps into the base over the course of the narrative. The flares and fire from flamethrowers occasionally provide brief periods of respite, but these are fleeting and the darkness soon floods the scenes once again, reminding you of the constant danger and vicious monster lurking within the shadows. Fire is the only way to hurt the thing, so the light and the flames always offer hope, because you can't trust the darkness, but you also can't even trust your own eyes, because what you see isn't necessarily always the truth. It's such a meticulously crafted movie that even uses the lighting and camera work to further this constant feeling of dread and mistrust. The Thing is a masterpiece in human horror. It's incredibly suspenseful and a relentless onslaught of paranoia and fear. It tells a simple story of an alien shapeshifting monster, but perfectly blends everything you'd expect from a horror narrative, combining practical body horror with a foreboding and oppressive soundtrack and incredible camera work. The whole movie has a very chilling and hair-raising feel to it, using every tool at its disposal to tell a very human story. It's not necessarily scary in the conventional, visceral way, but it's wonderfully suspenseful and the entire movie pens you into this deceptively open setting, creating an eerie claustrophobic feeling that heightens paranoia and shows how the danger and fear of the unknown can break any bonds, causing people to turn against one another. It keeps you as the viewer on the edge of your seat from beginning to end and even after the credits roll you don't know who to trust anymore. The script avoids too many clear-cut answers, meaning the cast and narrative remain shrouded in mystery. The horrific and gory creature effects raise the stakes constantly, escalating the human drama with its deception. It's a truly unique movie that remains socially relevant to this day, even if its legacy will probably unfortunately be the movie that inspired Among Us. And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to my diamond level patron Fallon Cortez and all my gold level patrons Alex Marston, Basil Disco PhD, Calvin, Daniel Shilato, Franz Horn AK Line Vortex, Herner Verzog, Luke underscore SY and Stefan Never Miller. Thank you so much for all the support.